Sorry, we just realized that um, <laughs> Don't have to. we hadn't started the recording. So we are starting now and we're here today. Do you want to just quickly say who we're here with? Yeah, Paul? we have Shelly Manlev, who's the co-president of the New Mexico Public Health Association. We have Tyler Taylor, who's on the steering committee or executive committee. I don't have this right in front of me. Um, for the Health Security Act, and he's a practicing physician. And we have Mary Feldblum, who has been at this for at least 17 years, um, now the executive director of Health Security for New Mexicans campaign. And we're off to the races. We had a little bit of sound quality problems with our computer here, Roxanne and I, and we had to switch computers. So we're getting a little bit of a late start. Yeah, but and we apologize we for go. that. It's the first time that's happened, but you know, keeps you on your toes. So that's my question too. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna ask uh, the first question. And uh, that is, you know, let's sort of start at the beginning. And we know that the Health Security Act was first introduced uh, to try to get that going in New Mexico, I guess in 1993. Yes. And so, Mary, can you um, tell us a bit about how that has evolved over the last 17 years? And 17, think about 93 to two. Oh no, it's 20, no, 27. <laughs> I'm a, Paul wrote down 17. Oh my 17. God, that's right. Uh, so yeah. I'm reading off the piece of paper here. <laughs> I was six years old when I started. <laughs> six years old. <laughs> but you know that the, um, Health Could Security you move Act. a little closer to the mic, Mary? You're kind yes. of not very loud. The Act was first introduced by two Santa Fe legislators, Representative Max Call and Lucky Varela. They were very innovative in doing this. And um, over the years, we have, uh, because of course it didn't pass, unfortunately, um, we, um, uh, those, those of us that were, it was a very small coalition at the time, but we went particularly to the southern part of the state and we're asking people if we're setting up our own health plan, what worries you, what, what should it look like? And we've run workshops, we've done presentations. The bill has been introduced um, every other year because you all know there's a 60 day session, there's a substantive one, not the budget one. And it has changed because of so much input. It has grown and evolved into something that I call a smothered in green and red chili. And there is nothing like it. Really, it, I have read other bills, California, Wisconsin, um, and it is, I think, the most sophisticated bill in the nation to uh, accomplish a real system of universal coverage and to control costs. You cannot, you have to do both. So, oh, your your screen is frozen, Mary. But um, I'm, we're assuming you're done. Oh. Maybe you oh, have okay. your internet okay. might be a little slow, but we can still hear you. Okay, good. So, boy, this is the night for uh, technical difficulties, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> God, we've done these things repeatedly and have never had a problem. So, <laughs> yeah, oh well. Um, yeah. I right. understand that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We can see you now. I mean, yeah. you're moving now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, great. All right. I'm not so, a <laughs> so I'm guessing most of our listeners know uh, a fair amount about the Health Security Act. It's been around for a quarter of a century, um, but uh, there may be some misconceptions. So um, can you lay out um, what the HSA would do and how it would alter the current health care system? And Tyler, you're a practicing physician, so this one's right up your alley. Sure. Um, just in quick review, the health security plan um, is a proposed systemic change to the way we pay for health care in New Mexico. Um, it uh, would cover roughly three out of four people in New Mexico, the people who don't already have good, basically federal coverage that, that uh, takes good care of them. So um, the Doing that that way sort of not only changes the way you're paying for health care, but it changes um, the way health care gets delivered because the incentives right now are so distorted and that this is a way of writing the incentives. Um, in the end of the day, it would end up covering over 99% of people in the state, either through the health security plan or um, 
through the, uh, these other federal plans that they have. It's a co-op style plan, um, meaning that the management of it would be handled by people, citizens from across the state who have this as their own insurance. So it would be a nonprofit being run by people who are running their own health plan. Um, the benefits of it are quite comprehensive. They're the same basically by law as what state employees get at this point. And uh, so that would be a huge um, plus. And it, um, a key thing too is that it shifts private insurance company from this very central role that it has to where private plans would exist, but they would only be offering secondary insurance. It has some ways of reducing healthcare costs substantially. One is to do global budgeting of hospitals um, so that each hospital works for a year off of its budget rather than it makes more if it does more hip replacements. Um, it also reduced costs by doing uh, bulk purchasing of medications. Uh, so driving, that would probably pretty quickly drive down cost of pharmaceuticals in the state. Um, the pay, how this system is paid for is fundamental. It, there's sort of three streams of monies that would come into it. One is uh, from individuals who have this plan. One is from employers uh, whose employees have this plan. And, um, and then there's all the public monies that already exist from state and federal sources. So um, that's the health security plan and how it works, how it's financed. The Health Security Act is the legislation that has to be approved by our state legislature in order for the plan to be created. So if we can get the, the act passed this winter, then over the next two to three years, the actual plan, the insurance plan itself would be created. It really has just so many benefits for providers and for patients. Um, but just some highlights are that um, providers would get to do what they really want to do, which is focus on good quality care for their patients um, and not on formularies, prior authorizations, negotiating with insurance companies, all of those things that are both time consuming and morale consuming. Um, with this plan, there would be no network. So patients can um, see who they want to, providers can refer patients to whichever specialist would be best for them, not who's just in their network. Um, Billing processes would be simplified. Instead of having to deal with so many different insurance companies, there would be just um, dealing with a much smaller number, um, much smaller number of plans within companies. And so um, that would simplify things a lot for medical practices. It, patients would see the benefit of that because the billing would just be all a lot more understandable. Um, Patients, of course, will really love the lower costs that we anticipate that they would experience. The overwhelming majority of people will pay less than what they're paying now. And um, that would mean that would be in the basis of lower premiums, lower deductibles, low pays, lower drug costs. Um, so um, that would certainly get national attention <laughs> if we could drive down healthcare costs with this. There would be more mental health availability because the plan has features that reward uh, mental health providers um, and support the provision of mental health services. You know, and, and just a really key fundamental thing is if you have a plan that's a lot simpler, everybody to understand, it's a lot more transparent, then you get a lot more trust and that just would make day-to-day -day life for providers and patients a lot greater. Um, and then I guess the last thing I would say is I'm absolutely convinced that there's thousands of providers, maybe tens of thousands of providers around the U.S. who are so fed up, just like I was and a whole lot of other New Mexico docs and practitioners are, 
They're so fed up with our current system. They, I think, would come here to practice to have a much simpler, fairer, less costly system. And that would be a huge boon for New Mexico to suddenly get this influx of providers who love our new system. Well, I think that's quite a bit great. of information there. We're going to have to make these a little more concise or we're going to be here till midnight. Um, so, <laughs> and, we'll, and nobody else will be with us. <laughs> so how about you ask the next yeah, one? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think this question is for Mary again. Sorry, Shelley, we are going to get to you in the next question, I think. Um, so, you know, obviously some form of the HSA has been introduced into the legislation for, you know, more than two decades. So what are some of the arguments that uh, were used to keep the bill from becoming law previously? And are you optimistic that those concerns are not gonna, again, undermine efforts to pass the bill in 2021? In the early years, um, the insurance industry lobbyists would stand up, page this, line that, and we took dutiful notes. But over the years, because of input from so many people around the state, we have really tightened up the bill. And their, their uh, criticism, their testimony, is never page this, line this. It's, um, we don't know what this is gonna cost. Um, you're gonna destroy choice for people. And of course, there's a difference between choice of plan and having really choice of doctor. And, um, and so uh, it's the insurance industry and the, um, um, and the hospital association too has not been supportive. But really the biggest barrier is has been the lack of knowledge that ordinary New Mexicans have of this and that they can tell their legislators that they want this. It is, education uh, is key and the fact that you have so many people here tonight wanting to learn more about the health security plan and they have got to spread the word and they have friends in other parts of the state that they can spread the word to. That is the biggest barrier to us if people don't know about it. This plan is, is, is major, and I want to stress that when it passes, this session is gonna take about two to three years to get up and money. It's not gonna be immediate. There's gonna be a lot of work to do to make this plan right. And uh, so, um, but, so we need enormous amount of support. Our coalition is probably the largest in the history of the state. It's 100, over 170 organizations. That includes, you know, farmers, the Asaki associations, the phar pharmacists as well, and, and nurse practitioners, the public health association, doctors. It's, it is um, huge. The NAACP has been very supportive. Recently, the All Pueblo Council of Governors uh, passed a resolution in support. So we're, it's a very diverse coalition, and we have traveled around the state because we want to make sure that those New Mexicans outside of Albuquerque and Santa Fe understand that this plan is is for them. It's not just Albuquerque and Santa Fe. Okay, well, thank you, Mary. It's um, long, long overdue. Let's hope its time yeah, has come. 27 years. What the heck? Why not now? Um, so this one's for um, both Tyler and for Shelley. Um, how do you think the COVID has exposed this need for a system like the deep like the Health Security Act. I mean, we've really seen how deeply flawed the system is. So if uh, first, Tyler, you could talk about it from the medical perspective and then Shelley from the public health perspective and, you know, a couple of minutes each. Well, um, there are many flaws that are there and have not necessarily been COVID exposed, but the ones that have, I think particularly relate to how um, health insurance is tied for so many, many people. Employment. So we've had this situation where vast number of people lose their jobs. And at the very moment when their income is plummeting, their future security is plummeting, and they're at risk for a serious disease, now they don't have health insurance. And it's um, tens of thousands. I think if I remember correctly, Mary, maybe it's 200,000 is the estimate for, for New Mexico that- 188,000, yeah, that aren't insured? That are not insured now, that lost yeah, their insurance. There are certainly more now. Yeah, and 27 million in the United States. Right. So- 188,000 was prior to COVID. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. correct. Mm -hmm. 
that's the, the, the really huge one. But then we also have the situation where hospitals have these business models that are based on they make the profit because they do enough surgery, they do enough MRIs, they do enough heart catheterizations. And suddenly when you have a pandemic and they can't do all of that, they're in a tailspin financially. And that should have never been the way we funded hospitals. Um, they should have been sort of funded to be able to do whatever needs to be done, but that's not the situation we have. Um, and then I guess the third big thing is that insurers are collecting all of these premiums, but outlays of money are way down because they're not paying for all these surgeries and MRIs and so forth. And where's the accountability of uh, what are they going to do with all of these excess revenues that they have that they're collecting because of the pandemic? There's no accountability there. Um, what, how about you, Shelley, from the public health perspective? I want to uh, reinforce what uh, Tyler said, particularly the first thing he said, which is at a time in which we've been looking at, does it make any sense to tie health insurance to employment? COVID highlights the insanity of that. I mean, we've all known it's a, it, it's a historical anomaly, you know, back to World War II, that uh, employers who were competing for labor weren't able to increase wages, so instead they started offering health insurance packages that were not taxed and they used that to compete for workers. And that's how we got on this path here in the United States. And it is a path, I know in my life, you know, there was a time when I left a job, needed to get health insurance and parts of me couldn't be covered. So this whole sense, you know, I had to on my list of, of looking for a job, one of the absolute things I needed is that I could get health insurance for my family. And actually I made more in terms of the health insurance I received 15 years ago, then I made hourly rate and I needed to do that. So that this whole way in which we have tied health insurance to employment, COVID has just opened up that chasm and demonstrated more vividly than ever that it is not a system that makes sense for employees or for individuals. I think a second thing that I wanna raise is that this is a time in which we all need everyone to have health care. You know, I need for each of you and for everybody in my community to be able to get tested. Testing is free, but people may not be aware that coronavirus related health services are not free. People still have to do their co-pays. They still have to meet their deductibles. In many cases, those are, you know, five, six, seven thousand people who don't have insurance are responsible for extremely expensive medical bills. So we need everybody in order to protect us all, we need everybody to be able to get treated. And um, if you don't have the resources to pay for healthcare, testing doesn't necessarily even make sense. I think there's a second thing, which is that people who have chronic conditions and immuno, who are immunosuppressed in particular are people who we want to protect from this virus. And those people, if they are dependent on their employer for health insurance, have to stay, go to work, have to keep their jobs. And we are putting them at an extreme risk. And again, an extreme risk so that they can have health care in case they get sick. That convoluted logic, I think, is really problematic. And you know, finally, from a public health perspective, and I know we're going to talk about this a little bit more later, but this virus does discriminate. It is not indiscriminate. That there are huge disparities in terms of particularly racial and ethnic disparities across the nation and here in New Mexico. And from a public health perspective, uh, the way in which un the uninsured in New Mexico, that also is deeply impacted by racial inequity. And, um, you know, in both in our state and nationally, I think it really, you know, presents a major problem that we are dealing with a health crisis and have such phenomenal and equitable response. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Shelley, and thank you, Tyler. Um, so there have been a couple of uh, comprehensive studies of the HSA over the years, one very, very recent. So, uh, and they found that uh, it's not only would it be very affordable, but it would actually save New Mexico money and expand access to healthcare. So Mary, can you tell us a little bit about those studies and their findings? There were two studies that I think you're referring to. One in, in 1994, the Lewin study, 
and another one in 2007. Both of them, by the way, are on our website. And both, um, they, they, one assumed that all New Mexicans were in this one health plan. It was more of a single payer model. The 2007 version was more like health security, where, um, and they, not everyone was in it, for instance, the military, military retirees, federal retirees. And um, they both is, concluded that and but that it's not that there are savings in healthcare. I don't want to. And no economist worth their soul is going to tell you health costs are going to go down. They compare the rate of increase of the current system to the rate of increase of a system like health security, and the difference between those rates of increase is what's known as savings. And you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars of savings in in within five years. In fact, both of those studies said within the first year you would dramatically see savings. So there are two, the, everyone's covered. Most are covered under one health plan in on the Mathematica. And uh, there are cost control mechanisms. What's I think critical about these studies, because I assume that you're gonna wanna talk about the newest one, is that they were done prior to the Affordable Care Act. So the Affordable Care Act has a Medicaid expansion program it has allowed more people to sign up for Medicaid. It also has a lot of, of uh, revenue to the states, uh, subsidies, tax credits, that these studies never took into consideration. The second thing is New Mexico had a very high rate of uninsured in those years, 20, about 22%. Our rate of uninsured is made between nine and 10%, probably higher now. But, it, but it's gone down dramatically. The more uninsured you have, so those two studies had to take that into consideration, you have to add costs to your new plan because you have to assume that they're not getting the kinds of services that they would had they been insured. So that adds costs. So, so the fact that there was a very high rate of, of uninsured and the fact that there was no extra subsidies from the federal government at that time both both uh, concluded that the, it was very affordable for New Mexico. There's the cost side and then there's the revenue side and both felt that both concluded that they were um, the revenue would be there to pay for the cost. Um, and so those are very powerful studies. There are something like um, um, I, I could see I'm getting frozen. <laughs> Um, you sound perfect though, Mary. Yeah, we can still hear you. Okay, okay. So I think there are 22 states that have actually done studies of plans like this, and they have all concluded the same. And I look at the, the uh, criticisms as well, um, but it's just the, the numbers are there, and it's so logical that if you self insure most people in one state, you're simplifying things. And if you implement things like global budgets for hospitals and negotiated rates so doctors aren't paying 15 different rates for the same procedure and dealing with tons of, of uh, different insurance companies, you're gonna see uh, money saved. And the other thing I wanna point out in any of these plans and the health security plan, my premiums go to an out-of-state insurance company that invests them. Now with a co-op model, my premium is gonna go to a dedicated fund. You're ta we're talking about billions of dollars, even at 1% interest, that's going to create a lot of money that can help invest in health infrastructure in rural and underserved areas. It's money that you don't have to dip into the general fund for. Okay, well, you actually answered the next question um, <laughs> about how um, with uh, the, the health finance environment during the other two studies, was much more um, difficult to navigate because we didn't have the ACA and we didn't have Medicaid expansion, which provides a goodly amount of revenue um, to augment the financial viability of the HSA. So with your permission, Mary, we're gonna move on to the next question that right. Roxanne will serve. And I can see we have a bit of a lag on our video, but I'm assuming you can all still uh, hear us. So I'm just gonna ignore the video lag. <laughs> and hope that you can too. Um, so this question is, is for you, Shelley. And so New Mexico significantly expanded Medicaid through the Affordable Care Act. And, and that has significantly improved healthcare access in our state. 
Uh, so why do we still need the HSA? And then there was a little question on the side in the chat earlier is, how does that impact uh, Medicaid uh, recipients? So I don't know, Paul, can you put up that slide or in, on Roxanne's pre oh. <laughs> We will in a minute. It's in my computer, not hers. Yeah. You know it is really not necessary. I mean, actually, I don't have it in color, but basically, Medicaid expansion was a huge boon for New Mexico. I mean, thank God, even with our Republican governor, that she saw the incredible benefit. Prior to Medicaid expansion, we rivaled Texas for the highest uninsured rate, 21, 22, 23 percent. I mean, almost a quarter of the people who lived here in New Mexico were uninsured. Post-Medicaid expansion, we reduced that significantly, but still, 10% of the people in New Mexico under the age of 65 are uninsured as of 2017. That rate kept going down and down until 2017, and it has been stalled around 10%. I think the latest figure, the Urban Institute did a study in December of 2019. Highly recommend people take a look at it. A very detailed analysis of the uninsured rate and the demographics of uninsured here in New Mexico. 10% of people under the age of 65 is 100, as we mentioned earlier, 187,000 people who, when they need health care, you know, they're lucky if they can get it. So I think it's really important, you know, 10% better than 22%, but that is not the kind of society that I want to live in. Those aren't the values that I think all of us have in the sense that health care is a human right. And when we need health care, we need to be able to get it without going bankrupt. We need to be able to get it without, you know, even if we have spending all of our resources. So Medicaid expansion, fabulous. We've got a long way to go, both in terms of covering uninsured people, as well as for those of us who have insurance. And, you know, I hear people, you know, in terms of opposition, people are afraid of change. I am very blessed. I work for the Santa Fe Public Schools. I have a retiree health insurance plan. I have to tell you, I would happily shift to make sure that everybody in New Mexico had what our state employees have. It is an outstanding plan. You know, those people who are individuals who have to purchase on the exchange right now, they have to deduct, they have to pay up to six, eight thousand, you know, six thousand dollars a person for out-of-pocket expenses if they have a serious health problem. They can't go out of state. The kind of plan we're talking about that our state employees can't have, and the kind of coverage with parity for behavioral health and medical health and uh, physical health and acupuncture and other kinds, you know, physical therapy. That's the kind of health care that we want everyone, including all of ourselves, to be able to access. So Medicaid expansion definitely took an important step. And as we even just saw our neighbor, Oklahoma, right? They just, a deep red state just voted for Medicaid expansion because the truth is most Americans want everyone to be covered in a, pot, in a way that gives them adequate health care. And I, I feel so excited at the work that Mary and Tyler and so many people have done. I mean, for 27 years to hold this vision and to make it smothered in red and green, I mean, we have really developed this unique tailored plan that has been time tested and you know, lots of input so that we have the opportunity in New Mexico, in a state that struggles with poverty and low wealth, to make sure that almost all of our citizens have, again, their basic human right from a public health perspective protected. Okay, well, thank you. I want to apologize to our listeners, um, our participants here. Roxanne and I are going nuts trying to make everything work on this because <laughs> um, we had problems with our computer in the beginning, my computer, so we're using hers, which is antiquated um, and slow and, um, and so, and we weren't prepared for her to have the slides. I didn't have They're the slides on my computer. Online, so. And so we're doing the best we can. And I can see I'm all. If we have frozen. time later and we can, and the slides transfer to my computer by email, which they're not doing right now, we will put them up and show people and talk about it again for another 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> so um, next huh. question is, um, while the COVID and those two studies have offered, um, uh, you know, very good information and powerful ammunition for making the bill law this time. I'm guessing you weren't exactly pleased with uh, the KNG Health Consulting uh, preliminary report. 
Um, Shelly and, and um, Tyler, can you tell us just a little bit about what you were actually hoping would come from that? And then we'll pivot to Mary, who will dig in and tell us all things wrong with it. Um, but we'll start with you guys just to tell us what you were kind of hoping would come from this. The, uh, the legislature had allocated $389,000 to do this study and it was supposed to be managed by the Legislative Finance Committee um, between July of last year and July of this year. And um, what we were anticipating was that they would identify one or two entities that were very capable to do this kind of in-depth analysis. They would look at five years, 2024 to 2028, and they would um, really get into the details of what are current healthcare costs and what are sources of revenue. And then on the other side, what would the projected costs be with health security and what would be the projected revenues and then do a real good comparison of our current system and an HSA based system. Um, they would use New Mexico data uh, to, to work from, not data from other states and past studies. Um, any future projections that they did would have ranges to them that they wouldn't just be sort of saying, here's the magic number. And, um, and that they would do it in a very unbiased way, that, that their language and their processes would, would be professional. Um, and then at the end, we would have a preliminary report early this year, like February or March, and then we would have a final report in late June, early July. Um, and all along the way that the Legislative Finance Committee would just be on top of this and watching to make sure that that the process was being followed correctly. Shelley? Yeah, the only thing, I mean, I, I think that uh, I did read 70 pages. It was quite painful, I have to say. And it felt like instead of being, you know, all the things that, that uh, Tyler said um, were the hopes we had, which it would really demonstrate what seems intuitive and logical that when you are spending 15% of your healthcare costs on administration, I mean, just that alone, and if you eliminate that, even if you're covering an additional 15% of people um, who don't have a revenue stream attached, and we're not, you know, we're talking about 10% of people, that, that this very carefully done report would demonstrate what makes logical sense, which what had been shown in 2007, and again previously, and in every other state study, that a system a systematic and a system of healthcare that removes that administrative expense and um, is feasible and will provide us all with much better health and much better healthcare. Okay, uh, I think do we still have Mary by audio? We don't. I don't see yes, her. Yes, still have me. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, let me see. Are we in this one? Yeah. So this, uh, this is for Mary first, and then if you have something to add, Tyler, um, maybe you can do that. So one of the findings in the recent, uh, KNG was the recent report, correct, that was done yes. this year, okay. um, was that the HSA would save New Mexico about $3 billion a year, <coughs> excuse me, over its first five years. Uh, yet somehow that that report or KNG concluded that um, New Mexico couldn't afford the HSA. So how is it that something that saves us so much money, not something we can afford? Yeah, yeah this I, I don't know if I can show you this. Does that show? Do you should see it? You can, so if you go up higher, you can show us. Okay. The yeah. orange, the the Get closer. Okay, to the to the all the way here <laughs> in two thousand. Can you see it? Up higher, okay. a little higher. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So this, <laughs> this, this is high tech. Okay. Mary, just explain it because it's not okay. coming across, and <laughs> it's in our blog from okay. uh, Tuesday. Good. Okay. Well, th that's Last you were talking about the three billion dollars a year, and um, what in Tyler mentioned. Then there's the revenue side. How do you pay? for when you figure out the cost, how do you pay for it? And you pay for it using existing 
you know, public dollars that like Medicaid, not all of Medicaid, because Medicaid includes long-term care. This plan doesn't. But what portions of Medicaid, what federal programs are out there that were, are already paying for health care that can be used to offset the cost of the health security plan? Then there's, a, uh, there's the employer contributions. Employers whose employees are in the plan would pay so based on their payroll and number of employees with caps to it. And, and then uh, enrollees would pay uh, based on their income. So if your income went down, imagine your premium goes down. And uh, with, with, again, with caps, with uh, dollar caps to it. They're claiming that over five years, you, you know, adding their numbers, which are very questionable. Um, can you, oh, what happened? Oh, okay. I, I find it finally loaded. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Um, we're claiming that uh, the, over five years, the health security plan costs $50 billion. So if you total, um, you know, each, uh, the 9.3, 9.5, 10, 10.1, 10.8, um, that's, that should be around 50, $50 billion. Then they're claiming um, that uh, it's uh, 7 billion short uh, because they're, they're saying 10 billion is available through do public dollars and, and 19 billion through, through uh, federal funding and 9 billion they're claiming through employer contributions and 6 billion through enrollee contributions. I, I'm a social scientist and they never justify anything. They never give you their rationale for this and they're making some really poor assumptions. Tyler spent hours of his time just looking at the public dollar issue. And uh, he can talk about, you know, that they made major mistakes. They have made so many mistakes in this, this report um, that it's really kind of, uh, as a social scientist, I'm truly embarrassed. Uh, yeah. And it is, it is terrible that, um, I mean, they, they, there are mathematical problems. That, you know, there's a cost here of 9.3 billion, but in another table, they claim it's 12, over 12.3 12 billion. So which number is it? You know, I mean, that's a drastic mistake. And, um, and, and, they're, and we're using the 9.3 because that's the one that they refer to in the text. <laughs> so that, you know, we, uh, they never tell you, for instance, in 2024, um, you, you start with your baseline, which is 2019 is when you'd have complete data. So you start with your baseline and then you have to go up to 2024. Well, what adjustments do you make? What are your assumptions? How do you get to, you know, um, what hospitals are paying, what doctors' uh, costs are, et cetera. And they never tell you. They never tell, give you information. And they don't use New Mexico data. It is grossly, it was a requirement in the RFP. The other point is, you notice that there's just one cost number in there. They were supposed to come up, and I think Tyler raised this, with different scenarios. Because we don't know, you know, there are a lot of what ifs. As an economist, you, you know, you love what ifs. And we don't know a lot of the situation that's gonna happen in the years to, to come. So you have to have different scenarios, different assumptions about what you think the cost would be and also the revenue side. Suppose the Supreme Court throws out the Affordable Care Act, then what happens, right? Of course, we know that from the two prior studies that they could throw out the Affordable Care Act, but the two prior studies said it was affordable. So, um, so this is, um, uh, you know, th this is, uh, does this answer your questions you, about this? Yeah, it's just, I am just, uh, and if anybody wants to go to our website, you can get a copy of our, our comments, the comments I, I submitted, which um, you can just read the first few pages and you get Max Bartlett's comments and, and uh, I, I try and summarize stuff. And I tried to write things in a not wonky way. Can you tell everyone what the website is or maybe one of you can type it into the www.nmhealthsecurity.org. Okay. And I'll bet Shelly's typing that right now. <laughs> uh, uh, did you, Tyler, do you want to tell us like what some I of the... Think, yeah, what he's discovered with the, with the revenue side. Revenue side of this. This is astonishing. Yeah, I um, looked at their, their supposed $7.4 billion shortfall over five years. 
and that they were saying that there would be $19 billion of federal money that could be used to fund the health security plan. And that just looked too low. It didn't look right. And so when I really did the research um, using the state legislature's website, input from people who are really knowledgeable about this stuff, um, you know, what I found was there's not $19 billion, there's $25.5 billion available in fed just federal money to, um, to support the health security plan. Coming up with state dollars was more complicated. There's a lot of pigeonholes in terms of where state money goes. Um, and I wasn't able to complete that. But how, does, how do you, as people hired to do a fiscal analysis, miss $6.8 billion in revenues that are there in the public record. Um, and, you know, I think that's, that's this huge question. And also, will they, in their final report, um, because it will totally change right. um, whether this is affordable or not. Right, right. So, um, you know, the KNG report was not exactly what you needed. Um, I'm guessing that what you were expecting was a glowing uh, recommendation to move forward. Um, but is there a way you can turn this to your advantage? Um, and we'll give this to Mary first and then throw it open to just about anybody who wants to chime in. We got about five minutes for this. Well, I mean, the two major sponsors of the Health Security Act, Representative Armstrong and Senator Ter Jerry Ortiz Pino are extraordinarily upset with this report. Not because it, it we weren't, uh, you know, I don't want a biased report. I'm not expecting, you know, certain conclusions. I expect so solid research, solid evidence, solid justifications, and not the gross errors in mathematics that you just heard from, from Tyler. It's shocking. And, um, there, um, and so um, what I think um, this is doing, because we're spreading the word about this, that let, let's introduce, regardless, we, there is going to be a final report. And believe me, I will go comb it very carefully and go over it and everybody, you know, if you're on our website or in our or alert system, um, you'll find out uh, what we think. But we should proceed regardless. And uh, there are a couple of reasons why. Um, we've got to do something about our healthcare system. This has a lot of support. This has been well thought out. It's going to, it's a go slow approach. It's not something that's gonna be, uh, if it, when it passes, it'll, it'll take two or three years to do. And uh, for, um, so then the is issue then for me is the setup costs. You know, there's this commission that has to, uh, in fact, with public input, begin to create the details of the plan. I cr the Health Security Act is like a recipe and we're gonna be the cooks. And uh, so, um, so how are we going to pay for it given the, the financial crisis our state is in? And Representative Max Call from Santa Fe and Lucky Varela years ago said, this plan should take out a loan so it won't cost anything from the, the general fund. Mm -hmm. Take out a loan. And because we're talking billions of dollars, once it's set up, it's going to e be easy to pass, you know, to pay back the loan. And the loan only needs to be for year one right now, for the first year, uh, to, to set up this plan. And so I noticed during the special session, there is a small business loan fund that was passed. You may have read about it. Do you know where they're getting the money from? The severance tax fund. So there are, uh, and I know I've been exploring this for quite a long time, of what what funds can we use uh, to actually um, fund this for its first year, and um, and so we're not taking from the general fund, which needs to pay for Medicaid, and education, and environmental issues. Um, is, is, so this is a, a good solution, and to push this forward, we need you, the public. We need the general public of New Mexico to truly say, it is time to do this. There are too many studies out there that say that this is going to save money. And even, uh, even in the, um, uh, the KNG, you saw that, that chart that showed that it's gonna cost less than the current system. 
And so that, that it's, that is in itself, I think a very powerful argument. And I'm finding that I've talked to some legislators about it and um, they, they, they are thrilled that we're thinking of ways of funding this without uh, getting into the general fund, but using this uh, idea of a loan. Okay, so well, um, yeah. thank you, Mary. Um, I hate to move along, but we've got a, just about three more minutes and we can go a couple minutes over, but Roxanne has a question for Shelley. Yeah, and actually Shelley just uh, typed into the chat um, some numbers here about uh, the uninsured in the native uh, population Hispan and Hispanics and those who don't speak English. So it's so somewhat uh, connected to that. And so what could be the impact of the HSA on racial equity here in New Mexico? And how is this addressing social Injustice. Well, we know that health equity and social injustice are, and, and racial justice are all deeply related. And just like with the environment, if we don't adjust racial justice, we're not going to address our environmental issues. The same is true with health. And I think the reason I type those into the chat, and I, uh, I'll include the, the place, the source of this. So in December, again, to December 2019, the Urban Institute conducted a comprehensive study of uninsured in New Mexico, and no surprise, there's huge inequities in terms of racial justice. And our Native American population, just like, you know, they are 13% of New, Mex New Mexico's population, and in terms of COVID, right, over half the cases, 54% of the cases in terms of COVID. Well, New Mexico on the whole, an insurance rate of 10.6%, Nationally, it's actually 11.2%, you know, kudos to us, again, Medicaid expansion, but 10.6% on average, but Native Americans have the highest amongst all racial and ethnic groups, the highest percent of uninsured people, 16%. Next is Hispanic Latinx, they say, the report says Hispanics, 12% of people in New Mexico, and in particular, I think we wanna highlight people who don't speak English, over a third, 34.5%. So these are, you know, very, in terms of just, and it's not the only part of the, it's not the only thing that the Health Security Act does, but it does ensure almost everybody. And so, you know, alone, just looking strictly at the uninsurance rate, we can see that when the Health Security Act gets um, adopted by our state and goes into effect, we're gonna see a, a huge impact in terms of racial justice. And one, I have to say again, as somebody who has you know, had various struggles with health insurance, um, that is so core to feeling like your dignity and your life is protected. So I think that's, you know, that's one level. The other level is of course, is that all in health insurance is not created equal and people's access to insurance by jobs. So when we think of certain job categories, hospitality industry, the construction industry, that believe it or not, healthcare industry, the people who are more likely to have insurance through their employers are people who look like the five of us on this call, and it's striking, right here we are. And we as allies, and I'm a you know, white woman, white Jewish woman, really need to be advocating for racial justice in every arena. And I think this opportunity to um, have our legislature and our state take a true stand around racial justice and health equity is one that is uh, we all want to get behind. Okay. And we've during this uh, pandemic, we've uh, the importance of those essential workers, which a lot of people of color has. I think, I mean, maybe that's like a silver lining. People are realizing how important these people are in our lives, and maybe you they know, haven't been paying attention to that. I think you know it's interesting because earlier when you asked the question about COVID, that. Um, uh, the novel coronavirus that Ty and I responded to, while it highlights the huge chasm, it also presents an enormous opportunity because right. we are all feeling the pain that people, you know, black, indigenous, and people of color have been feeling for a long time. Yeah, and I think yeah. that on so many domains. It's a, definitely a, a wake up call for oh. a, lot, a lot of white people. Okay, the last question is a softball question for Mary. Can you just tell everybody where they can get more information? And I'm sure while you're doing that, Shelly will retype it in the <laughs> chat bar so that people can just click on it. But go ahead, Mary. It's our website is nmhealthsecurity.org. And I think Josette in the chat room let people know exactly if you're interested in the 
comments to the KNG study, she gave she gives you the 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 source. Okay. Uh, yeah. And please, uh, you know, uh, you can get my email on that website. And if you have any questions or want to call me, 505-897-1803, uh, please to answer them. The more knowledgeable you are, we offer workshops, by the way, on the bill. It's called Mapping Your Way to the Health Security Act, which is extraordinarily important because it's not just Tyler and me and Shelly talking about it. It's you're reading it. And see, and, and since we are a society in which written words are very important, I think it's it's critical. And the more information you have, the more confident you have that this is the solution to uh, a lot of problems in our state, um, that then the stronger we will be this coming session. We need your help. We cannot do this alone. Okay, we're going to start doing the questions and um, that are in the Q and A, and we'll start right at the top. With but, the so, if the three of you want to click on that Q and A button, then you can see them as well. Although we'll read them out loud, we, we might not be able to finish all of them. There are ten there right now, uh, but if you see one that you think is especially important that you'd like to answer, then just let us know. But in the meantime, we'll start at the top. Um, this is, I think, Marjorie. Kmine's question. Uh, I see the M. I think that's who that is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Will undocumented immigrants in our community and their families be covered under the HSA? The answer is yes. There, the, there is a, uh, uh, it's not a citizenship requirement. It's a residency requirement. And even people who come to New Mexico from out of state who, to work, um, can uh, can be covered uh, if it's less than one year is a uh, but the undocumented um, can are definitely covered many of them are longer residents than some of us so <laughs> yes yeah. that's great right. so this is a question from Robert Verruti um, and actually I interviewed um, Speaker Egolf after the last session and he was extremely dismissive of the affordability of the Health Security Act. And that's basically what um, uh, Robert is asking, is who are the legislators who are against this bill or who you've identified, and how can we um, help uh, get them persuaded to uh, um, change their, their tone? Really, it, it, uh, you know, Santa Fe can't persuade uh, a senator from Hobbs. Um, you know, you know, you, it really, it's constituents. And we spend a lot of time educating people in different areas of the state. And they're the ones that have to persuade their legislators. And you have got to persuade your, your legislators in Santa Fe, you know, that, that you want this to happen. This, this is the time for it. And um, as a, somebody who's done a lot of lobbying in the state for many years, um, I, ne I don't like to talk about who's for and who's against because mm -hmm. people who are against can become for, people who are for can become against. It's constituents putting pressure, and this is an election year, so it's, it's very critical that you let, you're, you're all from Santa Fe, I assume, and that you, you uh, put pressure on your Santa Fe legislators. If you're from outside of Santa Fe, or if you know people in other areas of the state, Educate them, let them know about our website, let them know about our workshops, our presentations, and we're willing to do Zoom presentations in any area of the state. You know, have Zoom, we'll do a presentation. That's one advantage of it. And uh, so it's, it's uh, really constituent pressure that will uh, really be the critical key to success. Okay, did everybody hear that? We've got a lot of people on this call. And we got to put some. We got to put some pressure on. Sorry, I'm sorry. What'd you say, Tyler? Oh, just to throw in another piece here. If trying to make sense of the K and G report about costs per year of the present system and health security depends on which table you look at, and that's part of the problem. But if that table that you just showed is correct, that um, we're looking at about. 3.2, 3.3 billion dollars a year difference in cost 
And at the end of five years, it's $16 billion that is not being wasted the way we waste money now. What could we do with $16 billion to uh, improve a lot of services, health services all across the state, mental health, physical health? How can Mr. Egoff oppose something that saves $16 billion? So I think we really need to nail that down and him to base that uh, an answer to it. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll just keep going here. Galen um, Gisler is asking, and then Hamilton Brown, it's a similar kind of question. Has the LFC responded to the campaign's request to pull the contract? And if so, who are the likely bidders, bidders for a new study? And then Hamilton's question is, how has the Legislative Finance Committee responded to the latest study? Um, it's uh, LFC did not respond to our request to to uh, terminate the contract. We felt that K I from the very start I felt KNG was unqualified when I looked at their history, and they uh, it's it makes me extraordinarily nervous to <laughs> figure out what they're doing. But uh, Senator Bill Tallman uh, contacted David Abbey just mm -hmm. yesterday, and Abbey responded to him and said. Um, they have been reworking uh, the uh, the report, and it's going to be posted next week. And they're dealing with um, with uh, my Talman said. Well, Mary had a thirty seven page critique. I was thirty five pages, but um, and uh, and uh, that and they're dealing with that. They're they're coming up with four um, scenarios. I don't know whether that's talking about costs or or um, or revenue side and uh, making certain kinds of adjustments, but we'll have to see. I am very cynical about the capability of this company in doing a good job, and I, you know, they, as far as I was concerned, if they were seriously reworking this this report, it would have taken them several months because they they have not collected the New Mexico data that's available to them. Okay. So you're frozen. You're frozen again, Mary. But we can still hear you. Just okay. fine. Yeah. Yeah. So the next question is from Claudia Efferdink, and it's a El very Elfredink. Elfredink. I'm sorry, um, and it's a very good question. Um, does the plan intentionally include people of color and other marginalized populations in designing the plan? And does the large list of supporting organizations reflect the economic and cultural diversity of our state? We are. We have over 170 organizations, and it includes LULAC, it includes farmer associations, the Asaki Association, it includes the NAACP. Um, it is so broad, and we have reached out to all types of New Mexicans um, and over the years. I mean, we're, we're talking 27 years of, of uh, really uh, trying to listen to people, what their concerns are, and how to design something that is really going to help all of us feel secure. We call it health security because even those of us who have insurance are clearly insecure. Um, we never know what's going to happen with it and what the companies are going to do. And it, it, uh, all New Mexicans will be part of it. We have tribes in New Mexico. They're sovereign nations. So they can decide whether to join. We've had many conversations with the tribes and we were thrilled uh, a year and a half ago or two years ago when the All Pueblo Council of Governors decided that they would endorse this plan. And we got a lot of feedback from them and made changes in the, in the bill in 2019 to reflect their, their concerns. And so um, I, I, I really, it's, it's not only smothered in green and red chili, but it, it, it's a plan that should help the uh, all of us um, and the health disparities that so many people of color um, face in our in our state, Latinos, the uh, African Americans, as well as of course the Native Americans, and um, and uh, we think that this is going to create a very unique kind of plan that could be a model for other states. Okay. Great, thank you. If I, if I could add one piece to that. Sure. That, Mary, that struck me in reading, um, and that is that the commission 
is intentionally designed to ensure that uh, there's representation from every area of the state, not just Santa Fe and Albuquerque. And I thought that was one of the things that I appreciated in terms of the co-op nature that you really have paid attention to that representation. Thank you. Yeah, so there's a couple, uh, again, related questions. Jeff Selesky is asking, what are the credentials of uh, people that actually completed the KNG study and have they been confronted or challenged? And then Michael Spadaro is asking, yeah. how did they get the contract and who voted for them? And did they get industry donations? I mean, was it, was it a setup, I guess? <laughs> The, um, there was an RFP set, sent out, and LFC actually uh, asked, a, asked me, invited me to a meeting before they developed the RFP. And I gave them various studies, because there have been a lot of studies since 2007, and, and there's a lot of more sophisticated uh, analyses that are going on um, in terms of costing out a plan like this. And um, I, I very strongly recommended that they not allow a consultant to come up with one magic number and uh, that they ha have different alternatives, uh, possibility, different possibilities. And in addition, I, I said, you really have to have New Mexico data. It is real, when I read studies uh, in New York or, or even uh, mathematics, if you use uh, national studies to talk about physician overhead in New Mexico, you know, making assumptions it's not right and uh, you really uh, and what was wonderful is the medical society there was uh somebody in the medical society was willing to do a survey uh, and uh, kng just kind of didn't take it seriously lfc publicized it i found out later on that they were the only one to apply and someone put in that rfp that it had to be a national organization somebody had national experience which precluded the Bureau of Business and Economic Research, which was far more qualified to do this than KNG. When I got their name, I looked them up. They, most of their studies are from the American Hospital Association. And I looked at them, and th what d disturbed me about them is that the studies always came to the conclusion that you would expect the American Hospital Association to want. <laughs> which you know it was was bothering me and i was very concerned but um they were the ones that lfc selected um thanks to actually uh, senator john arthur smith they i'm sure he pushed to have two public meetings um and in which we were able to make comments one was their very first work plan which was so pitiful it was clear they had never even read the Health Security Act. You can't do a cost analysis of an act if you don't know what's in it. And they, they made so many, and so uh, we submitted comments. Then in March, there was another one, another uh, work plan that was also problematic. And we submitted co comments. And I, I, as a social scientist, I didn't tell them what their answers were. I said, here are the, the issues you've got to deal with. And the, these are the choices that you're gonna have to make. Um, and there are all kinds of studies out here. You know, you make the decision, but I didn't see that in their work plan. I didn't even see any collection of health data for two, 2019. You know, that's your baseline. You've got to do that. I, where was that coming from? And uh, so then they went off and uh, then came up with the preliminary report that came out in early June, which was so uh, terrible. And um, that, uh, I mean, I, it's, I, it was, it's almost insulting that a company could, could submit something like that to the state of New Mexico. They didn't comply with the RFP. They had mathematical errors. They had sloppiness and they never justified anything they did. Um, they just, you know, said, Here is our, here's what we're doing. And they had this, as Dr. Mezoff, who's on our board, said, it's like this magic box. They talk about a micro simulation model and nobody should be, ever be intimidated by it. something like that. It's like, what do you put into your model? What are your assumptions? What's the data? And they never really tell you what, what, what their information is and they never justify anything. So those numbers that, that were in the chart and that graph, we don't know where they come from. We don't know what their assumptions are. 
when, when they arrived at those numbers. And Jerry Ortiz Pino, Senator Ortiz, was really horrified. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, is, is this a setup job? I don't think so. I think it uh, it's, um, raises a, a lot of questions about uh, an RFP process, which I think that, you know, when they only had one bidder they, they, who was unqualified, they should have gone out to bid. And some of us would have tried to get Mathematica or Rand uh, or tried to persuade them, you know, why don't you let you know, somebody local do this? They're perfectly capable. New Mexico State or Bieber, perfectly. We have a lot of talented people that can do this. It's, it's, a, it's a, such a waste of money. Rand for New York was paid close to $400,000 for a New York study. Now, you know, Rand Corporation is expensive and New York is expensive. We were paying 389,000. So we were in the ballpark. We should have collected lots of data. If you look at a Mathematica study, which is on our website, you'll see that they have tons of information about New Mexico. You could disagree with their conclusions, but you've got lots of great data. In the, if you look at the preliminary report, every chart, every table they have, every figure they have, source, KNG. You never see sources for New Mexico data, never. I mean, okay, it's so let's, uh, I wanted to ask the panelists, are there any questions you've identified that you'd really like to answer? And, it, and while you're thinking about that, I'll just ask you, how does the New Mexico Health Security Act handle job loss in the insurance industry? And that, that question's from Kelly Powers. Because there's going to be some insurance folks losing jobs. No, KNG, and in one of my early comments, I said, this is an issue, is jobs. I mean, and both Lewin and Mathematica dealt with this and actually felt very few jobs would be lost and there'd be a big shift into healthcare. Um, so the big question today is um, what jobs do the insurance companies perform and what percentage of them are done out of state? Now, Presbyterian does a lot in state, but there was one, and I gave it to KNG, there's one study that LFC did um, of the Medicaid Managed Care Program and, and where the, where, and, and who's processing what in, in state or out of state, where are these jobs? And the other, you think about United, all these other companies, they're processing everything out of state. And so, you know, that's the first question you've got to ask. You know, if you've got what jobs are already out of state, then this plan is obviously going to have jobs and job creation, and it could hire a company to do what's called um, claims processing, third party payer. And so, you know, to look at the job creation of it is a complicated matter. They just didn't go into that at all. Um, and uh, so, but I, uh, you know, I, and I can't answer that question. I do not know. Uh, but I would sure like to know what percentage of jobs in the insurance industry are already done out of state. I think that's the number one question. Uh, I suspect quite a number of them. Did you, um, did Shelley or Tyler identify a question you'd like to answer? Or should we toss up another one? I, I liked, I was interested in Hamilton Brown's question about the differential income between primary care physicians and specialists and oriented docs. Um, there is nothing in the Health Security Act that specifies anything along those lines, but... Um, so just to make sure people, can you read that question just to make sure people know exactly what it was in case they're not seeing it? Okay. How does the Health Security Act deal with the differential income between primary care physicians and subspecialists and procedure-oriented doctors? Um, the, so it, there's nothing in the bill that addresses that, but when you're doing something as remarkable as New Mexico is talking about here and creating this giant systemic reform of how we pay for healthcare, it's the perfect moment to look at that issue and say, what's been used, which has been dictated by Medicare and the AMA and followed by Medicare and all these insurance companies, what if we don't follow that anymore? What if we decide we're going to create our own way of determining what are reasonable 
incomes for different things. So I, I think this is an opportune moment to revisit that, but there's nothing in the plan that calls for that. All right. Well, here's a question for you from George Carr. Um, could you clarify how hospitals will be paid under HSA? In Grant County, their hospital is claiming to be in financial crisis because, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, because of its inability to perform surgeries and other procedures. I'm guessing that he's saying that because of COVID. And then if the HSA is in place, will this problem be addressed or eliminated? Absolutely. Um, there is a term that most people have heard about. It's called global budgets. European countries use this, uh, Canada, Japan. Essentially, hospitals don't have charges the way we're used to, you know, pages and pages of charges, different uh, charges depending on your insurance company. It's just an enormously complicated system. And so hospitals have negotiated budgets and they have a guaranteed revenue stream. Maryland and Pennsylvania are experimenting with this. There is money available from CMS to actually do this. I mean, the federal government is interested in this because it helps save money with Medicaid and Medicare. And um, we tried to get a, a memorial passed last session um, and in the 30 day in rules and the hospital association opposed this, opposed having, we just said set up a, a task force with the hospital association, the rural hospitals, others, clinics and others and talk and, and see what kind of plan we can come up with for, for uh, a global budgets, because our rural hospitals like the, uh, like the Grand County one are in terrible trouble. And the rural hospitals love this idea. And, but it's Presbyterian that really is, is quite opposed. There's accountability, of course, if you have a budget, that, you know, you can't hide things. And, um, but we think uh, this leads into a very important point, which is our hospitals are in trouble now. And if it, health security passes this session, it's going to take two or three years. So what happens to those hospitals? Are they just gonna go belly up? We don't want that. So there are interim measures that we think have to happen so that the system can be better and survive and prepare for the health security plan. And global budgets is one of them. That should, uh, the uh, 1199, the, health, the Hospital and Healthcare Workers Union is very interested in this. And we're hoping that they could take the lead, maybe even the Public Health Association. Health Action was very important as well. And, you know, to really push for um, setting up a global budget system and there's federal dollars available to do it. So you don't, you know, it's not like you have to dip into the general fund. Um, the other issue, there's a pharmaceutical, uh, uh, purchasing Council that was set up by Senator uh, Jeff Steinborn from Las Cruces. And you know, as we all know, drugs are just crazy. And there was, again, a study done by the Legislative Finance Committee to show that if the state agencies together collectively purchased drugs, negotiated drug prices, millions of dollars would be saved. And that's no joke in our state. And so uh, this council is now looking at um, the ability to do bulk purchasing of drugs. Uh, there is an all-payer claim system that is being worked on by the uh, Department of Health, which again, you have to have an IT system, you have to have a, a medical record. So it's the beginning of setting up a process. All this will help health security and could might expedite it getting uh, ready for implementation even faster. So there, and, and of course the Department of Human Services really wants to expand, you know, get more people signed up for Medicaid and Medicaid expansion, assuming that those programs are still around. And it's heartening when Oklahoma, you know, says let's do it when the Republicans say we want it. It, it puts uh, our current president in uh, a real bind, but we don't know what the Supreme Court will do, unfortunately. So, but at any rate, there are interim measures and that's what global budgets would be a blessing to rural hospitals, how they calculate the budget. You wouldn't want them to look at last year's budget because last year's budget, they were biting their nails. It wasn't sufficient. So, you know, how to determine what's, what the baseline budget is, is very critical. And it's a very, uh, it's not like you have an entity in Maryland or Pennsylvania that just says, here it is. 
is working with the, with the hospitals. And I, it's a very exciting program. And I think it would really help uh, Grant County and, its, and many other hospitals and, uh, in our state. All right, so we're pretty close to out of time. And so we've got about three minutes. I was gonna ask each of you to take a minute and summarize, encourage, motivate, or whatever, say or add new. something that hasn't been yeah. said. So we'll start with you, Shelley. Um, we need everyone, everyone to work hard to support this issue. That the Health Security Act and the Health Security Plan that it would put in place is a justice issue. I said it, I'm, I'm just gonna repeat it because equity is just such a critical goal. The money, the costs, I think, you know, we all know the phenomenal inefficiencies of this non-system. We need a system to ensure that the basic human right that is provided by every other country that has anywhere near the wealth that we have is in fact in place for all of the people who live here in New Mexico. So I'm just really want to encourage everyone to uh, work hard this session to make sure it happens. Um, Tyler. <laughs> Well, no other, no other the people in no other no states other. in the country can say they are this close to creating universal health care in their state. You know, the, House, the New Mexico House passed this in 2017. The governor had on her website when she ran for governor that she supports the health security plan, um, at least in concept, we know that. So, we are not just carrying the torch for New Mexico, we are carrying the torch for the nation to be able to say, we have come through Mary's efforts and a whole lot of other people's efforts over decades to a point where we are on the cusp of making this happen. And we have just got to get it across the finish line. And this winter is the opportune moment to do it. Okay, Mary, you wanna finish up Thank and then you. I've got about 30 seconds to close. Okay, well, please uh, come, go to our website, nmhealthsecurity.org. Sign up for our um, information alert, join our campaign, and spread the word. We, we cannot get this, this bill passed without all our diverse and wonderful people in this state saying, we've had enough of the current system. We've got a good plan. We'll do it and we'll do interim measures, you know, so things won't go, we won't drown. But this is a clearly an, a, a wonderful answer. And New Mexico should be first. We should, why can't we be first in this? And, uh, okay. and I want to thank you all for attending this. It's really great. Absolutely. Okay, well, thank you all for, for being here. I, I'd like to close with this. Um, you know, we work with New Mexico Voices for Children all the time, and they publish a document that ch uh, on children and where we rank. And we rank 50th or 49th in damn near everything. This is a chance for us to be pioneers, not just in New Mexico, but across the nation. This is groundbreaking legislation. This is something that ought to inspire you. And so I'm, Retake will be sending out alerts in the next week or so to start peppering our legislators now. Doesn't help to do it in January, or it does help, but it's a lot more productive now. And so we'll be working with uh, Health Security uh, for New Mexicans campaign to get good speaking points that are consistent with their message, but the time to start talking to our legislatures legislators are now. So thank you all for being with us. Roxanne, did you want to say goodbye? I just want to say thank you, Sh Shelley, Mary, and Tyler, and thank you to all, all of you who attended tonight. We really appreciate it. And this a recording of this will be uh, up on our webpage in a few days and- um, Tomorrow. Oh, by tomorrow. <laughs> and it's under Zoom in our series, recorded Zoom in our series, and I think you can, you'll be able to find it there. Thank hey. you. Good night, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Just end it.